you give the listeners a brief introduction of the ring and how it works? So just a brief history of Aura. Aura was founded in Finland in, in 2013. Uh, we are on our generation three product now. Uh, generation one uh, ring was launched in 2015. Uh, Gen two was launched in 2017. And Gen three, um, our latest product was launched in late 2021. Um, Aura Ring is, as as Dr. Gundry just showed, and and I have I have a couple on my on my on my fingers, is uh, is essentially a, a wearable ring. Um, it's about it weighs about four grams, um, and and has um, a, a suite of sensors packed into it. And these sensors are integrated into the Aura Ring to measure different aspects of your physiology. So there. Are, Three, uh, three LEDs, three LED, LEDs with three different wavelengths in the ring: red, green, and infrared. These are um, the, the, these are in the ring for different types of measurements of your um, of of the blood essentially that is flowing through your through your arteries. Um, we have an accelerometer and a gyroscope. Um, uh, which measure your movement in three dimensions. Uh, and we also have seven temperature sensors that make very high resolution measurements of your uh, of your body temperature 24-7. Um, and the sort of the foundational um, or, or the most um, uh, sort of um, uh, the, the first things you would you would experience if you if you had an aura ring would be these three scores. Uh, their readiness, uh, sleep, and activity. And readiness is essentially a score that tells you how ready are you for the day. Are you well rested? Are you ready for pushing yourself, uh, or should you uh, should you take it easy today? Right? It, it's essentially a, a guide for you that tells you how how you might want to you know go through your your day, and also helps you understand what are the factors that contributed to how you are feeling today. Um, sleep being one of them. Uh, sleep is the second score, sleep score. Um, it tells you basically how well you slept last night. And that includes a bunch of different things. How much time you spent sleeping, the total time that you you know gave yourself the opportunity to sleep, how efficient your sleep was, where you, was your sleep restful, um, how much REM sleep did you get, how much deep sleep did you get, uh, did it take you a long time to fall asleep, um, and was was the timing of your sleep aligned with your circadian rhythm, right? So these are all these factors that contribute to the sleep score. And it essentially tells you, you know, how you're doing with, with respect to sleep and, and what are the things you can perhaps do to improve the sleep your, your sleep next night. And then finally, we have the activity score, which is uh, which includes about six, I think, six contributors. Uh, and they, it basically tells you um, how, whether you have, been staying active? Are you moving regularly? Um, are you meeting your daily activity goals? Uh, how much, how frequently are you training and how, what is the volume of your training? And also, uh, are you giving yourself enough recovery time um, to, to essentially, you know, re help let your body recover and, and uh, get ready for, for, the, for, for activity again the next day? So let me ask you one thing. Um, so my wife uh, loves to tease me. She, she'll say when we get out of bed in the morning, how did you sleep? And I'll go, just a minute, I'll let you know. And I you know, pull up the aura results. And she says, that's ridiculous. I want to know how you slept. And I said, well, this ring knows a whole lot more about how I slept than my perception of how I slept. Uh, what say you? Uh, am I right? Are you right? Or is my wife right? This is all just fanciful thinking. Yeah, no, it is. It is interesting. I think there are a lot of a lot of studies that have tried to compare uh, how your subjective feeling of of how you well you slept or how you how you think you slept aligns with the objective measurements. And the interesting thing is that the, these these two things don't correlate. Well, I mean, you would expect them to, yep. but they don't. And I think that is one of the reasons why having this objective data, in addition to, I don't think that how you feel is not important. It actually is very important. And, you know, not, not just for sleep, but for any aspect of your health, as you would, you know, you know you, you're a trained doctor, so you, uh, you'd probably, you know, be an advocate for that. But um, when it comes to sleep, it's the same thing. I think it's important to know or 
understand how you're feeling, but it's also important to understand um, the objective aspects, the data behind what um, what are the factors that may be driving um, how, how well you slept or how well you did not sleep. And I essentially identify some of the gaps between your perception of sleep and what your body is experiencing during the night. Right? The, the other thing is that sometimes, you know, you need... Um, the, that this type of sleep depth, depth to build up before you actually start feeling some of the effects, right? When with data, you can actually have a little bit of an early warning to to warn you that you might be heading down a path that, you know, may be harmful for your health, right? And um, I think one of the one of the um, interesting things that are that sleep scientists are discovering is that sleep debt is not something that you can just pay off, right? It's not. You know, if you if you get like two three hours of sleep for a week, um, just by sleeping more the next week, it's not like you can just catch up. Right? Uh, there is there is a deficit that can be sustained over very long periods and and can have almost have some kind of permanent impact on your on your health, uh, especially when you have se severe sleep deprivation. So data is, I think, not not everything, but I think it's a it's a it's an important aspect of understanding your sleep. How we were talking off camera, how has the sleep tracking technology evolved over time? Because uh, this is now the Gen 3, and you mentioned that Gen 4 is on the way. Um, yeah. what's, what's changed? What have you learned over the past uh, number of years? Yeah, so Aura, you know, when, when Aura started in 2013, the focus was on sleep, right? So we've always had a very strong focus on measuring sleep and and you know getting getting deeper insights for our users on on how they're sleeping and what they can do to improve their improve their sleep. Um, and and so from a from a sleep measurement point of view, we have essentially been continuously at at work improving how we measure sleep. Um, also, in terms of, from a sensing point of view, how, how can we go get more accurate measurements? And so if you look at our evolution from Gen 1 to Gen 2 to Gen 3, we have essentially added more sensors into the ring that en enable us to measure more aspects of your physiology. Uh, we've also pushed towards increasing the resolution. Um, one of the things that we've done in the, in the most recent generation of the Aura ring which is an enabler for us to to go to this more advanced algorithm that we are working on um, on 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 implementing right now into the ring is 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 simply increasing the memory. Uh, so we are doing more processing on the ring, right? So th with more sensors, we are capturing more data, and in order for us to get the most out of that data, we also need more processing power and more storage. Um, and so the same thing that is happening in sort of the you know, machine learning, deep learning world with the explosion of data and and, ex and, and advancement of these uh, techniques for processing this data, we are we are able to you know do some really amazing feats, right? Uh, and the same is true for what we are doing at you know in, with the Aura Ring. So our next generation algorithm that which you just mentioned is essentially taking advantage of all these um, added sensing capabilities in the ring, along with uh, really advanced computational capabilities that we are unlocking with the new hardware and uh, and coupling that with advanced machine learning techniques to to I think deliver the most accurate sleep tracking uh, yet um, you know if you think about the history of, of of measuring sleep that is sort of a, you know the first the polysomnography which is um, which is the clinical standard for for measuring sleep uh, that was invented in 1973 or 70, 74. Uh, so it's still relatively, you know, recent in terms of the, you know, the, the, the ability to measure sleep. And again, polysomnography is something that has typically been performed in a sleep lab type of environment where you go in, you spend a night wired up, you know, you have, you know, hundreds of electrodes and devices set up to you, and then you're asked to sleep in a strange new environment. And that's how that's that's been the standard and science of sleep. Um, that is changing with more home sleep testing, but but it's still very cumbersome and and you know the, from a setup point of view. Um, and and so the science of sleep is also evolving. And and Aura has been leading the charge in terms of um, evolving the science when it comes to wearables. And I think we'll continue to, to to do that, you know, for for 
for, for a long time, I think. Okay, let's get back to sleep in general. Um, hard charging Americans say, well, I'll sleep when I'm dead. That's the least thing I have to worry about. Uh, but in fact, we know that you know lack of sleep uh, kills you. Uh, I mean, it definitely shortens your lifespan. Uh, we know that blue zone people in general get eight to 10 hours of sleep a night, and they actually frequently take naps. Where is the science now? How much can somebody get by on four to five hours of sleep, or are they going to pay for it eventually? Or is there a range where each of us needs, and how do you, how do you find that out? Big question. Yeah. Most, most people need seven to nine hours of sleep a night. And there is variability. You know, there are people who have this genetic mutation that it's a very, very small percentage of people who may be able to get by with less than that, right? But most people, by far, majority of the people need about seven to nine hours of sleep. And you're absolutely right. I think we we have a massive uh, sort of epidemic of lack of sleep that is going on. And and, um, and I mean, some of the stats you mentioned were quite, 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 quite stark. Um, one of the stats that I know is that you have one in five car crashes are caused by drowsy sort of driving, right? And that basically, in, just in the U.S., results in about 7,000 deaths a year. Right? So it is a matter of life and death, literally, right, when, you come, when it comes to, to lack of sleep. Um, and then there are all these other, other potential long-term effects like you know, there's been linked with uh, these these proteins building up in your in your brain, um, beta amyloids and tau's, um, and that are linked with potentially causing Alzheimer's in the long term. So, so and then there are also also risks for hypertension, diabetes. Um, you know, it affects your immune system. So there there is there is a whole lot of science um, behind sort of sleep as probably one of the best things you can do for yourself to improve your health and in multiple different ways, both sort of short-term improvements as well as longer-term improvements to your health. Um, and, and, you know, around this, this aspect of getting enough sleep helps you improve your health, I don't think there is much debate around that, at least, you know, fr from, from a scientific point of view. I think sleep is, is, um, is, is quite, quite critical for, for functioning. And it's sort of like, um, an, an essential biological need for, for, for humans and animals too, right? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. When I was a, um, a surgery resident, um, surgeons, uh, I remember when I, I went to the University of Michigan uh, for my training, and I, I came from Georgia Medical School where we actually, as medical students, uh, worked through the night. And... When I went to Michigan, uh, the medical students on my service said, well, you know, it's five o'clock, uh, we're going home now. And I go, well, what do you mean you're going home? The most important stuff is going to happen, you know, tonight at, at two o'clock in the morning. And they said, no, we're not allowed to be here at night. We have to get our sleep. And I'm going, are you crazy? You know, they were, and this was, you know, a long time ago. And they were actually well, way ahead of the curve. And we now residency programs uh, have controls on how long you can you know be on call how long you can be awake uh, when i was chief resident i went four days without sleep on the chairman's service and then i slept for four hours and and went at it again and oh wow. yeah and we now know that Wow, you know, that's like me driving a race car uh, without sleep. You know, clearly everybody had impaired judgment. Now, luckily, yeah. I don't think I killed anybody, but, um, but that was sort of the culture. And we now know that that's, uh, that's crazy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that is one of our, you know, one of the, the, um, uh, the missions, like, our, you know, what, what, Aura wants to do is sort of this ma making health a daily practice. And I think the simple act of, you know, you mentioned that the first thing you do in the morning when, you know, your wife, your wife might ask you, how did you sleep? And you go to your aura. 
And it's it's this act of checking in, right? Simply trying to be mindful about how did you sleep, right? I think for me, there are lots of benefits of Aura and like the data and the insights. But the the, the biggest one in my mind is, is this um, a change in your mindset about checking in, right? The first thing in your morning and thinking about how did I sleep? And, and you know, let me understand this. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, as we... As more people use aura rings and and, and in general, I think the, the awareness of the importance of sleep becomes, um, you know, more widespread. I'm, I'm hoping that all of these we will see improvements across a lot of these other uh, aspects, right? Like long-term impacts on health, you know, on also the shorter-term impacts that you you know sleep has on your on your ability to perform and and um, you know. Um, uh, be well in, in during the day. Hey, you mentioned something earlier that I think is an important message. I, I want to I want to talk about that. Many of us have been taught that well, uh, during the work week we have so much to do. We have to get it accomplished. We'll work late into the night, and we'll we'll catch up on the weekends. We'll sleep in, and that you know kind of makes sense, but your findings and sleep study findings in general say, no, that's not the case. You you literally cannot catch up. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, I, I think catching up, you do, people, you do see the pattern, right? When you have, you know, if you look at patterns of people sleeping in during the week and, and, and weekends, and we look, we see that in our, in the d- data of our Aura users as well, uh, you see this pattern quite clearly, shorter, you know, sleep opportunity during the week, and then people try to catch up during the evenings. And there are actually some really interesting um, cultural differences as well. If you look at, you know, people across different countries, you see different patterns sort of emerging. Uh, but, you you're, you know, I, I, I think that this, this pattern of people sleeping less, whether it's weekdays or certain days, you know, when there is um, more work or stress and then trying to catch up is it happens and we all do that right i think we, we probably all as you did give your example i think we've all done that um the science i think is building up to say that it's not it's not that by catching up you are essentially erasing any of the negative impacts right it, it probably helps in some ways to just catch up so I, you know it's not a bad thing to do to sleep more if you have been sleep deprived but at the same time have building a lifestyle around this idea of I'll deprive myself of sleep for a few days and then I'll catch up during the weekend or, you know, um, it's the the science is increasingly telling us that that is not a sustainable approach to, to, to sleeping. I think one of the most foundational things you can do for, for sleeping well and and your health is to just build a very consistent sleep schedule. Um, And I think that is also one of the things that, you know, Aura users learn very quickly is, you know, just build a consistent sleep schedule. Introduce good sleep hygiene into your into your evenings, right? Um, how you wind down. I guess things that you, if you start doing these things consistently, you know, you will you will see better sleep and better health as a result of it. Yeah, uh, you know, part of this I think is we now know that you know, we have multiple twenty four hour clocks within us. Um, we have a 24-hour clock in our brain. Our gut microbiome operates on a 24-hour clock. And we obviously have clock genes in all of our cells. And I th- think, uh, I tell my patients, essentially, you can't beat the clock. Um, you may try to, but this whole idea that we should be you know, in time with our circadian rhythms I'm convinced, uh, I just got back from one of the major microbiome meetings in Paris, and we're more and more convinced that a large part, or at least a significant part, of jet lag is actually our microbiome clock doesn't (coughs) catch up with our sunlight clock, and that (laughs) it's the lag in our microbiome that's actually causing changes in the biochemical productions that they are affecting our brain with. So uh, there's still a lot to learn about all of this. Yeah. No, I think the science is fascinating and it's still, you know, there, there's so much that we need to learn. Um, 
And and as I was mentioning, I think before before we started recording, um, sleep has been thought of as predominantly a brain process, but it is a full body process, right? Real in reality, I think that's just how we've been measuring it. And as the science evolves, I think we'll learn that sleep is connected to pretty much every aspect of of our physiology and 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 all the processes that in, that, that in our that happen in our bodies. Um, so it is it is fascinating, and, and that's one of the reasons why I feel like you know um, Aura's early focus on sleep was was quite visionary, right? You know, in 2013, if you think back. Um, most of the wearables were focusing on counting steps or, you know, activity tracking and those types of things. Sleep was not necessarily a big part of the conversation. Um, and, and, um, and so the foresight, you know, was, was quite remarkable in terms of you know, focusing on sleep and really going deeper into understanding your sleep. Okay, we talked about time of sleep, but probably more important, and I think you guys are really leading the way on this, is sleep efficiency. What, what happens from the time you go to bed till the time you get up the next day? Yeah. What, I mean, come on, I go, I go to bed, I go to sleep, and then I get up. Uh, that's pretty simple, but you're saying there's a lot happening that you probably ought to know about during that time period. So, so what's, yeah. what's sleep efficiency? Yeah, sleep sleep is is a fascinating process, and and I, you know, I, I think that I've I've uh, in terms of learning, I you know, I've probably just scratched the surface of what you know the um, how sleep is uh, from a function point of view and and the physiology of of sleep and things like that. Uh, so there's a lot happens uh, you know during sleep. Sleep efficiency, you know, to answer your specific question, sleep efficiency is a very simple metric that just tells you how well did you sleep? So it is essentially describing um, the amount of essentially person, you, you went to bed and you woke up. In between that time, how much time did you sl- spend sleeping? So when we are sleeping, we go through these stages. There are, there are, at a high level, there are four stages of sleep. Wake, um, REM, light, and deep. And light and deep can be subdivided into two more stages each. So N1, N2, and N3, N4, and I can, I can talk more about that. But at, at a high level, there are these four stages. And, and most of our nights, we cycle through these stages, right? Um, and, and typically, I think we experience um, about four to five 90-minute cycles of these stages, right? Sort of these cyclical patterns. Um, and, and essentially, efficiency tells you that, you know, how much, how much of this time were you in the wake state and, and how much of the time was spent in the rest of the stages, right? So it's a high level metric, but it's a very powerful metric that tells you how well you are sleeping. When you're giving your, your body the opportunity to sleep, how well are you able to take advantage of that opportunity? Opportunity, And then you can, you know, from sleep efficiency, you can go deeper into understanding, you know, when you are sleeping, how is your sleep architecture? Is how much time are you spending in your light, light sleep, REM sleep, deep sleep, each of these stages has their own significance in terms of the benefits and what they do for your body and mind. Um, and so sleep efficiency is the first place you would want to start, but then, you know, you also want to go deeper into, you know, how, how you're sleeping in, in terms of the stages. So I notice, uh, particularly when I'm, um, when I'm sleep deprived, uh, or, you know, when I'm up with a patient or something, or um, time zone travel, uh, I will uh, frequently, the first few nights after these episodes, have a lot more deep sleep. And personally, I, I like deep sleep. I, I think, uh, and others think, that that's when we do our uh, brain cleaning, our glymphatic wash. And so, it, to me, it's actually a confirmation that, hey, you... Uh, your brain kind of took a hit in terms of its repair functions, and good news, uh, your brain's you know catching up on its cleaning function. Is that just a fanciful thinking, or can can you see those things? No, you you do. So if you if you uh, for example if you uh, push yourself and work out you know harder a day, you will see you know potentially like increased deep sleep during the night. You will also see uh, reduced latency 
in terms of falling asleep. You'll fall asleep faster because your body is just, you know, craving for for that sleep, right? And and then what you would see is like deep sleep is, you know, a, a, most of the deep sleep is preloaded into the night. So like the first half of your night, yeah, that's when you get most of your deep sleep. And you will see that you will, you know, if you're very tired because of physical exertion or other types of exertion, then you would you would quickly get into that deep sleep stage and 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 it's likely that you would see more more deep sleep when you when you're you know kind of trying to recover from from uh, from different stressors um, you know typically if you if you're like going through your normal life normal daily life you know without sort of these types of um, exertion periods uh, most adults would see about 15 to 20 percent of their sleep time they spend in deep sleep um, and this decreases with age so as you age you you will you will spend less time in in your in your deep sleep. So it's you know it's not it's not like you always need to have uh, you know a fixed like th- there is an age component that that will also also play uh, play a factor. Um, and you're absolutely right. Deep sleep is 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 remarkable in like that that restorative power right um, from like things like muscle growth and repair to um, to you know cleaning up your brain and you know flushing out. The, the, these proteins that are building up through the day. Um, it's also important for your metabolic health and function. I think you probably, you know, um, know a lot, a lot more about what that than I do. Uh, and also immune system, right? I think kind of healthy, healthy functioning immune system. Deep, deep sleep is quite, quite critical to um, to that as well. I and others, uh, including Dale Bredesen, the author of The End of Alzheimer's, and David Perlmutter, think that we really should try to avoid eating for preferably three hours before we go to sleep. And do you guys see an effect of eating close to bedtime, either changes in sleep or do you, you know, so. Absolutely, yeah. No, absolutely. I think late meals are one of the, one of the key factors that, you know, you will notice if you use an aura ring, you know, you have a late meal, you will see it in your data. And you can actually just, besides your sleep staging data that you, tells you more about how you slept, if you go to your physiology, physiology data, if you look at your um, your heart rate, you know, you, get, you in, the, in the aura ring, you can actually see your trend. You will see that your heart rate will stay elevated for a longer time, and it will take longer for your heart rate to, to, to go down um, if you had a late meal, right? and basically what is happening is your 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 body is process, you know, kind of in, is sort of in the, under stress, kind of processing that food and and uh, and that late meal, and it is it is having an impact on on your ability to get get good sleep. So what I think we have found, you know, from a science scientific point of view, that people who sleep, um, eat early and eat a smaller meal at night uh, and in the evening, um, they tend to have better sleep. Right, they tend to sleep better because their uh, their their body is more ready um, to to go to sleep and get take take advantage of that opportunity that it's getting. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think that's caffeine is another factor. Um, keeping your environment cooler. Um, you know, we, one of the things that happens when you go to sleep is your body temperature lowers, your core body temperature, and that is essentially preparing your your body to get to sleep. And one one of the ways you can promote that is by creating a cooler environment for for you to sleep in. Right? If your environment is 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 on the hot hotter side or warmer side, um, it is going to make make it harder for your body to to sleep. And that is again one of the reasons why we have a temperature sensor in the ring is. Temperature is a very key um, metric to track uh, in order to understand sleep and, and how well you're sleeping. So what you're saying is my, my wife's mother told her that you always had to sleep with the window open. And so you're saying that that old wives' tale probably has some truth to it. Yes, yes. And the same reason why, you know, taking a warm shower before going to bed is also also promotes um, um, promotes sleep is because when you take a warm shower it's sort of from a thermoregulation point of view your body is going to you know your core body temperature is going to go down you know in response to that you know the the heat right so so that actually promotes exactly that phenomenon um (laughs) all right so you mentioned uh okay so you're you're measuring temperature on the finger uh 
let's suppose I sleep with my hand, you know, outside my pillow and it's up above my head and it's a cold room. And how do I know that that's my core temperature? What, what have you done to correct for that? Yeah. So we, so we don't, first thing, we don't measure your core temperature, right? We measure your finger temperature. There are actually some really interesting properties of measuring your sort of temperature on your periphery, right? Um, uh, uh, when you're the palm, are, are most of the sensing that happens in the aura ring is on the palm side of your hand, all of our um, uh, heart rate, like the, the, the um, where we sense the, how the blood is flowing through your arteries, that happens on the, on the palm side, temperature sensing happens here as well. And when you're, when you're, when you, you know, when your body is um, kind of um, this heat exchange, a lot of that happens through, through the, through your palm, right? And so what the phenomena that we measure is actually opposite to what, hap what is happening at the core. So when your core body temperature is dropping, the temperature on your finger is actually going up. So we see the opposite phenomena. The other interesting thing is that while your core body temperature doesn't fluctuate by, you know, significantly, right? Like I think we see about two to three Fahrenheit change in yeah. your core body, right? Because your body wants to keep your, you know, you, you don't want to see large fluctuations there. Uh, but on the finger, you see a much larger change. So the signal that we are getting on the finger is the amplitude is much larger compared to what you see in the core in terms of just the magnitude of change. And um, and what that does is that from a, so while we are not measuring your core body temperature, what we are measuring is a very high quality analog of a signal that is telling us how your core body temperature is changing, which direction, and it is very, very sensitive. Um, and so when, in terms of an algorithm and how we use that data, we, uh, one of the things that we do, and we do this for a lot of our, of our metrics, if you, you know, as, as you probably have noticed is, we, uh, we build a baseline for you, right? So that baseline is based on a, you know, long-term days and sometimes even weeks of data. And one of the ways we account for these factors, right? Like one day, let's, you, let's say you decided to sleep with your hands under the blanket. One day you decide to sleep. You know, there, there are different things that could happen. But what we do is by using a long-term baseline to adjust for these types of smaller variations. And also during the night, when we, when we are using your temperature, um, we are actually processing temperature data in a way we are, where we are trying to um, um, deal with these types of artifacts or outliers, right? So, so there are some interesting processing techniques as well as this sort of approach for using long-term baseline data that enables us to really do a good job in terms of like understanding your, um, how your temperature is fluctuating day to day and even within the night. All right, since I mentioned my finger, why did you guys choose a finger um, rather than most of the other tracking devices, whether it's an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or a Whoop, are worn on the wrist? What, I mean, why the finger? Other than it's incredibly attractive. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. so I think there, I would say there are, there are, three, there are three reasons, right? There are three factors uh, behind that, that choice. One is um, one is associated with kind of it's it's a, it's a, it's an incredible incredibly easy form factor to to get used to when you are getting a wearable device any device any new a piece of technology right the first thing you, there's a there's a period in which you need to adapt to that technology to get used to it you know having um, and 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 with wearables one of the big factors. Is, is that a lot of people buy, you know, wearables, wrist one wearables, and, you know, a lot of people don't make it through beyond a few weeks. They end up in your drawer and just they, people forget because it just, the, the getting used to is harder. The finger form factor has been remarkable in, 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 the, in its capacity to, to get, for people to get used to very, very quickly, right? And so what we see is within the first week, people are just, it becomes of sort of like a second nature to use the ring. So that's one. The second one um, is this aspect of the signal quality, right? So when you're talking about health tracking, and as a doctor, you probably appreciate this quite a bit, is that 
you want the best information possible in order to make decisions about health, right? Sure. The same is for, for the ordering or any variable, right? The better information you have, the better signals you have, um, the better information you're capturing and the better insights you'll be able to deliver, right? And so the fact that we are making all these measurements on the, on the palm side of your hand helps us deal with things, you know, like uh, skin tone, right? On the palm side of your hand, the skin tone factors are less prominent compared to when you're making measurements on the wrist. Um, you also don't have other things like hair or other, other factors that are impeding these measurements. The other um, thing that helps is that when we are measuring with um, on the palm side, we are actually measuring directly from your digital arteries that are flowing in, you know, in, in, your, in your fingers. Um, most of the wrist-worn devices are measuring from capillaries that are located on the back of your hand. So in terms of just the power that you need from a signal point of view to get similar quality data, uh, we are an order or two magnitude lower in terms of uh, when we are making, making measurements on the finger. So more higher accuracy um, and higher quality of signals. So that's the second reason. And the third reason is, is, is sort of this, this idea of, you know, it's more, I guess, maybe more philosophical, which is, we, or I mean, you know, our, our philosophy is that we want to be there uh, for you when you need us, right? When, we, you know, you can't see notifications, there's ordering doesn't distract you, doesn't kind of, when you need the data and when you want to, you know, um, understand what is what is going on with your with your health, how you're sleeping, et cetera, ordering is there. Otherwise, it sort of blends, blends in your background. Right? It doesn't it's sort of like transparent from a technology perspective. So I think those are those are the three main reasons, I think, um, that that has driven our choice of the, the finger form factor and, and the ring form factor. And I think um, that has driven a lot of the success we've had in terms of health tracking. All right. Um, I think one of the exciting areas that you've pioneered and others have caught up a bit is heart rate variability and I was actually um, involved years ago in uh, as a principal investigator in a study looking at who should get um, automatic implantable defibrillators and people have heard about defibrillators with uh, uh, Senate candidate Fetterman, who got a defibrillator. But we, uh, we looked at who should get those based on heart rate variability in people with ischemic heart disease. Yeah. And we found, interestingly enough, that low heart rate variability was, was very predictable, was a good prognosticator for your risk of uh, sudden death from fibrillation. And it was actually one of the things that correlated well with who we felt should get a defibrillator. So I've always been fascinated with heart rate variability. And uh, years ago, I was presenting at uh, a Mind Body Green uh, meeting in Tucson, Arizona. And one of Aura's people, a young man uh, from Finland, and I were talking about heart rate variability, and I was showing him mine. And mine uh, usually runs, oh, 70 to 80. If I'm very vigorous in exercise programs, I'm 130, 150, which I view as a good thing. And he's showing me his data, and he's 270. And I'm going, you know, I hate you. You know, how'd you do that? Besides the fact that you're 25 years old. Um, and my wife, who is actually a great athlete, uh, big time former marathoner, her heart rate variability is in the 20s. And uh, she says, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to die soon. Well, she, she's not. But explain heart rate variability and why I should be interested. And explain to mm -hmm. me how I can help my wife, uh, number one. Uh, and number two, I have a number of patients who have low heart rate variability. And yet they're actually pretty impressive uh, athletes. Uh, I'll just use my explanation. They, my wife has a V8 engine. 
that lumbers along. I mean, she has, her resting heart rate is like 42. Um, yeah. And I said, you're just a big lumbering V8 and your RPMs are so low that that's you. <laughs> Me, I'm, I'm a turbocharged four cylinder. And when, when I really need it, you know, I can, I can, I can get the gas going, but I, I need a lot more. I, I've just got a smaller engine. Uh, is that just making it up for her, or wh what do you th what do you think about heart rate variability? Yeah, heart rate variability is is fascinating. I think in the science around heart rate variability and 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 how to interpret it and and what it means for your health um, is is uh, I think it's really. I mean, a lot of the work has been happening in the last few years. To be honest, I did. Especially, I think wearables have been a big driver for for HRV awareness. Like HRV is not something that people, you know, I would think maybe five, 10 years ago, the thought about on a regular basis. Now it's, it is becoming, and it is it is quite a powerful metric, right? As you, as you mentioned, it, it has, um, and I was completely like, I was, when you were describing that you were using this for these type of, you know, important medical decisions back, you know, several years ago. Yeah, this probably, 20 years ago. 20 years ago. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not surprised that you were, you know, you were ahead of the curve there. Uh, but also, you know, it just, it just, uh, it's just fascinating to see that there, there, there was like, if you have people who are experts and under, who, who have that understanding, maybe they they were using that, that metric, you know, for some decision making. And I think I expect that we will be, you know, HRV is going to become something that we will probably start, start tracking from medical records point of view as well as, as a metric you know, over time. I think it's, it's, it's quite powerful. HRV, you know, just for the benefit of, of the, the, the listeners, HRV is, it, heart rate is essentially measuring your, um, how, how frequently, how many beats per minute your heart is beating, right? Um, and it can be higher, it can be lower, right? You know, and there are lots of factors why that would be. HRV is essentially measuring how regular is your um, heart rhythm, right? Right. Um, if your if your heart rate is sixty beats per minute, it doesn't mean that every second your heart is beating. It's not like a metronome, right? There is going to be variability, so it could be like 0 0.9 seconds, one point one. Like between beats, there could be there could be variability, and that is what heart rate variability is essentially measuring. How 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 much, you know, how 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 um, consistently your heart is beating, or how much how much it varies. And surprisingly, like you you know, interestingly, sort of. Um, higher the heart rate variability, the better. That's generally sort of how we how we think about it. And and uh, your heart rate variability is quite fascinating, you know. And like heart rate variability typically declines uh, with age. And for your age group, you will probably be in, in like a very high percentile from a from a from a heart heart rate variability point of view. Um, I think generally speaking, higher heart rate variability indicates you know better heart health, you know, and better sort of uh, sympathetic, uh, a better sort of balance in your autonomic nervous system, but um, but I think there is also in terms of interpreting HRV. I don't think we should get caught up in in absolute numbers. Um, I think it's better, from my point of view, to think about what your heart rate variability is, and it could be you know in the twenties or thirties, or it could be like you 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 know seventies or seventy eighty, or it could be like this person from from Finland, you know, super fit athlete probably who might be like high, and that's a very like a extreme, right? Good. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think what I I how I think about heart rate variability is that. Tracking heart rate variability is extremely important. It tells you about how well you're recovered. Are you is your body in stress or not? And it is it's a good metric. Like just the changes in your heart rate variability up up or down relative to your baseline gives you a good indicator of that. And there are things you can do to improve your heart rate variability. It's you know it's 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 not something that if if your heart rate variability is thirty it's not like you can double it right like it's it's a it's but you can improve it right? if you improve your um diet right there are other fact there are factors like exercise and getting getting um fitter those are things that could that could move the needle from a heart rate variability point of view and get help you get healthier but again like you 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 the example of your wife right who's, who's an extremely fit athlete um you know nothing wrong i think in 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 our heart rate variability, and I don't know how much 
room she has if she's already super fit to, to change that. I think what, what I would, un, un, until more science builds up and helps us understand what are some of the risks, right? If you're a super fit, fit athlete with your resting heart rate in the 40s, which is, which is phenomenal, right? right. Um, you know, and, and your heart rate variability is 30, is that a cause of concern? We don't have the science to, to say, you know, to, to build that kind of, um, the, you know, correlation or, 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 or insight. But right now, I think we do understand that paying attention to you, how your heart rate variability, the balance of your heart rate variability, and that's actually one of the, one of the contributors we use in calculating um, your readiness score it's essentially how is your heart rate variability changing compared to your baseline? If it is a little bit better than your long-term baseline, that's great. If it's a little bit lower, you know, we, we tell you, right, that you might want to pay attention what, 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 what is going on. It could be illness. It could be stress. It could be that you've been pushing yourself too hard and not giving your body enough time to recover. Um, so there are lots of factors, right? So I, I think my general advice is that not thinking about HRV in a purely absolute terms, um, follow the science and, and let the science build up and, 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 you know, help us understand more about how we want to use this. But I, I think that, you know, HRV is, is going to be a very important metric that we will, I think everybody will pay cl close attention to uh, in the future. In a similar vein, as a nutritionist, I got to ask, can this, can this data guide us in food selection? What foods are affecting us positively? What foods are affecting us negatively? Or do we not have enough data? Yeah, I think I would say the data is is building up, right? We talked about, you know, late meals as an example, right? Right. Um, you know, that you could also you could also get some insights into the quality of your meal, right? If you're having a meal that is you know, very lot, lot, with a lot of sugar, desserts, big. You will see a difference between a healthier meal, even if it's a late meal. You will actually probably see a difference in your in your physiology that that will tell you something about the the, the stress that a meal put on your body, right? Um, but I think the science is science is evolving. One thing that I'm particularly excited about is people who are looking at data from you know wearables like the Oura Ring in con combination with CGMs. And, and food logging and tracking to really understand the association between, you know, nutrition, your your sleep, your activity levels, your physiology, and and your your ability to, you know, uh, control your blood glucose, right? And I think there is some really fascinating insights that will come from uh, from that type of work that will help us, um, I think, understand and more at a personal level, right? What are how how are different dietary choices affecting um, our health. Um, and um, yeah, I would, I think I'm, I'm, I'm quite fascinated about that, that aspect. And uh, I'm actually curious to hear what, what, what your thoughts are on that, since you, you know, this is such a big focus area for you. No, I think, you know, we certainly see people um, with, oh, high sugary food intake, uh, particularly late at night, you're right, their, their heart rates are often through the roof and are very slow to come down. Uh, and I think that's actually a good variable. We, we know that um, the longer it takes you to digest food, we actually put a huge amount of cardiac output into our digestive tract to, uh, to facilitate digestion and absorption. And mm. I think, and others think, that that, particularly at night, should be directed to your brain for brain cleaning and brain washing. And I, I think mm. a lot of the evidence of this late meal or even snacks before bed being detrimental is because mm. uh, we've, we, our heart output, cardiac output, is directed in the wrong place. And it, it should, mm. be, should be going to our brain and our muscles for repair uh, during the night. And if it's down in our gut, it's in a way very detrimental. I think it'll be very interesting to also see, I know you, you guys uh, are, are tracking predictability of illnesses, predicting the onset of an illness. And I think there's actually a lot of value here. Um, we've noticed through the years that 
we, we measure several markers of inflammation. I'll just bring up one, which is a HSCRP. And we, we see our patients, they get their blood drawn about you know, two weeks before we see them. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll be a prognosticator. And I said, uh, you got sick a, a couple of days after you got your blood drawn. And they said, yeah, you know, how'd you, how'd you know that? And I said, well, your, your C-reactive protein and your fibrinogen was up. And they said, well, but I wasn't sick when I came in. I wouldn't have come in. I said, well, I know, but it was actually happening in you. And we saw it in your blood work, but then it, you know, it, it appeared. And I think you guys are now getting pretty good at, at showing you know, previews of something's happening that you may not be aware of. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And this, is, um, this has been some phenomenal work that has been done um, by, by researchers across you know, many institutions uh, over the last couple of years. And also a lot of work that we have done at Aura that has, that has shown that um, there is really some predictive power in, in, in these metrics. And one of the, re the you know, the, again, going back to this idea of building your baseline, which is what basically we do, right? When you, when you get an aura ring, the first couple of weeks you're building your baseline and then that baseline evolves with you, right? It's not a static baseline. And what that enables us to do is to look at these even small changes, you know, that are occurring relative to your baseline, give us an idea of something might be going on. And when we see these changes that happen consistently, right? Like, so today there was a little bit of change and then tomorrow there was slightly bigger change. You know, that tells, you know, that has the power to actually, and we've seen this association that we can, um, we can see two and a half to almost three days ahead of um, the time you start feeling symptoms and go get a test, right? We can't say whether you have COVID or flu or, you know, what illness it is, but we do see that there's something stressing your system um, and that, you know, you may be coming down with an illness. Um, this was something that actually, um, I think there was a there was a Finnish entrepreneur um, in like March 2020 who was uh, who was traveling in in Europe, right? So this was early days of of COVID, and one of the things that he noticed was that or the readiness score was in in like 50s, and his his typical readiness score it was used to be like 80s or 90s, and um, and and he also noticed that there was about a, a one degree Celsius, so like 1.8 Fahrenheit increase in his in his uh, temperature deviation right so he put those two things together went to get a a covid test and tested positive right so that was like the first known case of somebody who looked at their aura data thought something was off even if he was feeling fine he was not feeling anything specific and then you know he obviously developed symptoms and and then there have been uh, several large studies there was a, a massive study at ucsf called tempredict with more than 65,000 um, Aura users participating in that study, contributing their data. There was a 10,000-person study that the Department of Defense did with their defense, uh, their, their defense innovation unit, um, and also a large study that was done at uh, West Virginia University in the Rockefeller Institute, Institute Neuroscience Institute, um, in about I think a thousand or so healthcare professionals. And all of these studies have consistently shown that the ability of you know data from the Aura ring having this sort of predictive power. Um, and we've actually built up a, a, a commercial solution that you know, organizations are using, NBA was using uh, during the pandemic you know, to, to manage the risks of you know, uh, spreading infection. So I think this is, this is really fascinating. Again, an area where the science has literally kind of built up over the last two, three years, um, but, but the potential is, is, is quite fascinating. Right? Um, and and you know you could you could you could imagine uh, a scenario. There was a I think there was a paper in Lancet recently uh, from the Scripps Institute where they uh, where they were talking about how data from these types of wearables could be used as as a as a sort of um, early warning sign of potential pandemics that could be spreading. Right, just by looking at these patterns of people coming down simultaneously, you know, in regions. Um, you know, that, that, that could be some really powerful uh, applications in the future. I think from my standpoint, I actually am impressed with the power of vitamin D to break viral illnesses. And I think 
if we had that sort of data that, hey, there's something about to happen to you, uh, let's preemptively go after it with, for instance, high dose vitamin D, which is what I do. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not saying everybody should, uh, but that's what I and my family and my patients do. But yeah, mm -hmm. getting this information early and then acting on that information, I think is even more powerful as we go towards yeah. personalized medicine. Exactly, yeah. And a big, big, um, big role that we think we have to play at Aura is, is in health education. So yes, we are you know, a health tracker and you can look at your data and all that. But ultimately what we're doing is helping you, you know, educate yourself about your health, what these metrics are, how they relate to your health, and how you, get, you can make, make better decisions. And I think that's sort of a larger, if you think about a larger sort of vision, um, that's essentially what, you know, um, and, and I think it's going to be fascinating to see people become more aware and, and, and you know, use, use the data that we are capturing with ordering in, in these ways that, that are um, going to be quite fascinating from, from the future of health perspective. Yeah. The next episode of the Dr. Gundry podcast is waiting for you now. Believe it or not, some of the best ingredients, nutrients in citrus are actually in the white pith. That's the stuff that you peel off and throw away. 